Um, um, let me just get started. So hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the good old days of conversation about design and planning for an aging population. Thank you all for coming. My name is Daniel Vioka, I'm a design critic in urban planning and design here, also the co-founder and principal of uh, Interboro Partners, which is a design firm based in New York City. Um, we have an amazing group of people here, um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I basically just decided to try to invite the most interesting people I could think of in the world to talk about this issue, and here they are. We're very fortunate to have everyone here. Um, so I, I, I joke to uh, my students that uh, clever puns for senior citizen-related design initiatives are, are quickly running out. Matthias Holwick coined New Aging. C-Lab in New York just had a symposium called The Senior Moment. Uh, my partner at Interboro Partners, Georgine, is teaching a studio at NJIT this semester called Urban Age. So good luck to the next architect who decides to run a studio or a symposium on this topic. Um, but this is a senior moment, um, or an urban age, and people are aging in new ways. Um, let's take a look at some statistics. Uh, by the way, so I'm going to just make some introductory remarks. Um, introduce the panelists and then turn it over to our panelists who we're all here to see. Um, so between now and 2020, the senior population will increase by 50%, a rate 10 times the projected increase in the non-senior population. So if you look at age distribution, we're going from something that 1950 looked like a spire to a single family house to something like a cruise liner. Um, and uh, uh, so one question is, where are all these seniors going to live? Uh, on the one hand, moving to a retirement community in Florida or Pokey Land will always be an option for seniors with means. Um, in fact, we're starting to see a further segmenting of the retirement community market. So we have Rainbow Vision, the world's first GLBT retirement community, and we have senior hippie communities and, and all kinds of stuff. Of course, there will always be the Villages, which is uh, almost 90,000 people right now, the biggest retirement community in the world. That's not going anywhere. Uh, but, on the other hand, consider the following three facts. 89%, um, according uh, to one survey, uh, by the AARP, 89% of seniors today would prefer to age in place in their neighborhood or home indefinitely if they could. Two, as few as 9% of seniors say they want to live in an age-segregated community. Three, retired seniors are increasingly seeking ways to re-enter the workforce, either by choice or by necessity. In the next 10 years, the number of workers 65 and up is expected to increase by more than 80%. Okay, so seniors want to age in place, remain functioning members of their community, but by most accounts, our communities are ill-equipped to accommodate them. In a MetLife study from 2005, 54% of municipalities surveyed had not even discussed their community's ability to accommodate aging in place. The consequence, of course, is that the built environment uh, presents a lot of obstacles to those who wish to, uh, to age in place. So it's easy in some ways to understand the appeal of purpose-built retirement communities like uh, the villages where everything is designed for you. Villages, they have a circulation of golf carts, you know, which I think we'll hear about uh, in theme. Um, so, this brings us to uh, an important question Is it possible or even desirable to create a, uh, integrated, age friendly environments? Um, or is there a, a kind of zero sum game between the needs of seniors and the needs of non seniors? Um, should we uh, you know, time lights for seniors who walk at four feet per second or non seniors who work? walk at five feet per uh, So my office, Interboro Partners, has been looking at naturally occurring retirement communities um, uh, north uh, in New York City, um, which is one of the most innovative models of aging in place that Ann Bookman can talk about. Um, these are places where there just kind of happen to be a lot of seniors, uh, places that weren't designed for seniors, but that for one reason or another are home to many. Um, once upon a time, someone had a good idea to fund North with a combination of local, state, and federal funds. 
use these funds to retroactively service these marks um, with the kinds of amenities that seniors need, activities and uh, shopping, um, uh, recreation, and there's a lot of kind of financial and medical literacy, and uh, they, there's uh, a lot of them have used their funds to hire on-call uh, social workers who check in with seniors and kind of create a sense of, uh, of community, and in some ways advocate for the rights of senior citizens. Um, interestingly, in New York City, almost all of the Norks uh, are towered in the park. Um, so a lot of the research that my office is doing right now, that I'm not going to talk about too much, um, is looking at this kind of funny, unanticipated situation, the, the kind of aging of this modernist ideal. Uh, these certainly weren't designed for, for senior citizens. Um, but, you know, and, and we don't need a demographer to, to know this, just visit a tower in the park, uh, which, uh, you know, which you'll see a lot of, a lot of senior citizens, uh, see a lot of signs of shivers as well. Um, but in some ways, the, the towers work, uh, work decently for, for senior citizens. There's a remarkable amount of adaptability and resourcefulness. Um, so we see that the, the, the elevator is a great amenity. Shorter uh, trip to, uh, to services than you might find, for example, uh, if you live in a traditional uh, uh, street where you have a longer way to go to the avenue. The balconies work well. The green spaces work well. The common space on the ground floor uh, has been used in all kinds of ways, laundry rooms, uh, supermarkets. Uh, and, you know, moreover, most towers in the park in, in New York City are cooperatives that were developed by unions for their unionized workers. What this means is that built into these buildings is a legacy of cooperation, of people kind of caring for each other, cooperation is all over the place. And it's one of the things that's given rise to the movement. Uh, so, um, but there are a lot of uh, questions. North sound, uh, sound sensitive enough, but of course, uh, you know, what is the future of the North? Once it's retroactively serviced, is it natural anymore? What happens when these co-ops go market, seniors cash out, cash in, and the building gets younger? Uh, what happens when a neighborhood North is rediscovered by young families? Should North be temporary? Uh, if so, what happens to all the amendments, the grab bars, the sound of the the carpet, the things that they install for the sake of um, age-friendly design? Uh, there was one question about uh, uh, about aging in place. Uh, one many that I wish to discuss uh, tonight with our distinguished guests. So what we're going to do is uh, ask um, all the panelists to make uh, 10 to 15 minute presentations. Uh, this will be followed by a presentation um, of kind of uh, accumulated best practices that um, a class here all the good old days uh, as a community. So, um, so, and then we'll, we'll just turn to, uh, to discussion. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce our very distinguished guest. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, first of all, the, the change to our program, Matthias Hallwick at the last minute um, uh, had, to, had to back out, couldn't make it. Um, but we're extremely lucky uh, to have Lisa here from the MIT uh, Age Lab. Uh, but let me start with uh, Dr. Ann Bookman, uh, Senior Research Scientist in the Helen School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Uh, she's a social anthropologist who has authored, uh, among other things, start, uh, uh, Starting in Our Own Backyards, How <coughs> Working Families Can Build Community and Survive the New Economy, uh, which is an ethnography of 40 working families that extends the discourse on work family bounds to include issues of community involvement in civil society. Uh, Dr. Bookman served as executive director of the MIT Workplace Center at the Sloan School of Management at MIT from 2001 to 2008. She's also worked in government as a presidential appointee during the first term of the Clinton administration, serving as the policy and research director of the Women's Bureau of the U.S. Department of Labor. Tonight, um, uh, Anne will be speaking about innovative models of aging in place. Um, Dr. Lisa Ambrosio is here from the MIT Age Lab, which some of you might know. Uh, it was created in 1999 to invent new ideas and creatively translate technologies into practical solutions that improve people's health and enable them to do things throughout their lifespan. Lisa is currently working on uh, is currently uh, working with uh, Joe Kaufman, who's the director of the Age Lab, on social aspects of aging. Uh, the questions focus. Uh, uh, what an aging population will need to enhance and improve their quality of life 
and to enable elders to live independently longer. Uh, so tonight, Lisa's going to talk about some recent work of the MIT Age Lab. Um, uh, Catherine Lawler, the External Affairs Manager for the Atlanta Regional Commission. Um, she provides state and federal <coughs> government affairs support on critical issues of transportation, land use, environment, workforce, and aging. Prior to this role, she worked with communities across the U.S. trying to become more age-friendly, including four years as the director of Aging Atlanta. Um, she was a fellow at Harvard at the Joint Center uh, on Housing Studies and served as staff <coughs> of the Congressional Commission on Senior Housing and Healthcare in the 21st century. And tonight, Catherine's going to uh, talk about the work of the Atlanta Regional Commission and the work that it's done on aging, some of the most groundbreaking work that exists. Dean Simpson uh, is a Co Copenhagen-based architect and researcher teaching at the Royal Danish Academy of Arts, uh, Art, Art School of Architecture. Also teaches at uh, Bas Bergen, where he's professor of architecture and urbanism. He received his master's in architecture from Columbia, uh, and his doctor, doctorate from ETH, ETH Zurich. He's formerly a unit master at the AA London, uh, assistant at the ETH Zurich. Uh, formerly uh, associate partner at Zillow Scafidio, uh, and a senior researcher at the Future Cities Laboratory in Singapore. And his book, Cheritopia, Retirement Communities of the Old and Young, is forthcoming with Lars Mueller's publication. This is also the title of the talk that we're going to be giving tonight. Uh, so welcome to our distinguished panelists. Um, so um, we're going to start, um, the, so the order will first, uh, Anne, uh, then Dean, um, Catherine, Lisa, and then the presentation from the research studio. Um, so, uh, please join me in welcome, welcoming Anne Hanna Thank you.
Um, I want to talk, I'm going to have to speed through this. I can see 10 principles for <coughs> healthy aging housing design that I would encourage people to think about critically. Um, then I'm going to talk very briefly about six different kind of models that I think are very innovative about it for aging and community. And end with just some kind of questions uh, to all of you about well, what does this mean if you're an urban planner, an architect, a landscape architect. So I think what's important to say in terms of context is that there's an incredible amount of change going on in terms of these issues of aging and housing and community. Um, I tried to outline for you here um, sort of what I see as the traditional aging in place kind of construct, which is basically, you know, people living alone in their own apartment, you know, sitting in their own couch in front of their own TV, very, very isolated. Um, usually in age segregated housing, whether it's a senior housing subsidized building or a continuing care retirement community or any kind of retirement community, very age segregated. Um, their driving and access to public transportation is usually very limited. And many people um, are fully retired. They've kind of gone with this full stop um, model of working where once you hit 66 in social, social security, you just stop and you have very little ties to your career or your coworkers. Um, and basically, in this more traditional model of aging in place, the elder is seen as really like a client of various healthcare providers, social service agencies, and so on. What I think is really emerging, what is very exciting, and what I see is more of a uh, aging community framework is where you um, may live in a very similar physical space, um, an apartment or a house, but you're really connected to friends and neighbors. Um, you live in an age-integrated either building or neighborhood. You have access to public transportation, which gets you to various people and activities that you want to be a part of. Um, that you have an ongoing relationship to work, either through some kind of flexible part-time work, possibly in your old workplace, possibly in a new workplace, or through volunteer work. And this is really, really important that elders are seen as partners in a process of transformation. Um, partners to people that work in traditional aging service agencies, healthcare providers, planners, and, and so on. So I think that this, um, the, the whole idea of healthy aging, I don't know if this is a term that's familiar to many of you. Um, Kathy and I and others have been sort of beating this to death for a couple of years trying to figure out what it, what it really means, but it's very popular um, term among people that work on aging in the United States um, right now. And it, it really, I think one of the really critical points about it is that it links um, the individual to the community. Um, and as I said before, it makes a, makes a change from seeing elders as, as sort of clients to be provided for to people who really have a tremendous amount to contribute to a, a change and planning process. Some of the basic tenets of, of healthy aging are, first of all, that aging is not a disease. I think everybody knows that in this culture, aging is really still looked at very negatively. There are a lot of stereotypes, very negative stereotypes about elders. Um, there's a lot of denial about people getting old. There's a lot of cosmetic procedures and makeup that you can put on to try to look young. You're not supposed to look old. Um, and then other kind of key pieces of healthy aging have to do with um, educating um, elders about their own health care, making them very involved and informed in a lot of their own health care decisions, promoting their engagement in various activities, and generally empowering them. And so th these are all um, kind of tenets of this new concept of healthy aging. Um, what I want to talk about before getting into some of the, uh, what I call, the aging design principles is just the importance of looking at housing for elders in a community context. And there are obviously many, many um, ways that people use the term community. Um, very often it's looked at just as a kind of geographically bounded space, but it has many other meanings. Um, you know, we talk about the black community, we talk about the Latino community. You might think of your community if you were raised um, in a particular religious tradition in terms of your parish. So 
So there's just a lot of a lot of different ways to think about it. And now many social networks are not even face to face; they're they're virtual. So um, I want to talk briefly about sort of ten principles for healthy aging housing design, um, and just to kind of stress that I think we need to really move beyond thinking about senior housing as a question of bricks or mortar, how many units we're going to build, how many are going to be subsidized, how many are going to be market value, and really try to place planning and housing construction in a much broader vision um, that, that takes a lifespan approach that says that we're all aging and that it's very meaningful and beneficial to all ages for them to, to mix and, and to learn from one another. So. The first one is affordability. Um, I think that many of our, historically, many of our retirement communities, and Daniel was alluding to this before, really are for people with quite a bit of means. Um, and I'm really interested in the kinds of housing design that can be accessible, um, not just to very low income people, but to very moderate income people with fixed incomes, and um, figure, figuring out ways, ways to do that. Um, the second uh, healthy aging housing design principle has to do with being environmentally sensitive, and I know that this is something that I don't really need to explain here. GSD is talked about all the time, but um, I'm really interested in some of the models that are using solar powered panels and water conservation and energy conservation and renewable materials and so on. I think that's got to be part of um, healthy aging housing design. Um, the third principle has to do with density, the importance of making senior housing in areas uh, uh, where there are retail and um, public transit and all different kinds of um, resources and facilities that seniors need. There's no way for seniors to age in an active and healthy way if they don't live in one of these uh, sort of mixed use dense areas. Um, also important, I think, is the issue of universal design. A lot of times this has been talked about in terms of the disabled or people who have various kinds of physical <coughs> handicaps that are very uh, striking. But I think for uh, people who are in an aging process, these principles of, of aging design with you know uh, wide doorways, floor surfaces that prevent falls, um, you know, electronic outlets that are the right height and appliances that are the right height and so on. All these things are part of universal design. Um, another important principle, I think, is this issue of age mix and generally inclusiveness, that we want to create senior housing where people of many different cultures and backgrounds and uh, ages can live together and, and learn from one another. Um, service integration, I think, is really important. We already have certain kinds of senior buildings that have supportive services, but I think we need to kind of open up that whole area and think about it a bit more broadly um, and figure out how spaces can be built in where, for example, things like physical therapy and occupational therapy can happen right in the context of an apartment building um, where uh, you know, there are special spaces, let's say, for people with dementia or Alzheimer's, along with people who are very cognitively um, intact. Um, another important principle, I think, is mixing public and private spaces, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when I show you a few examples, um, where you can have some individual private space, like your bedroom and your bathroom, but other spaces can be shared and where um, within a building and then where outside spaces also encourage interaction um, and sharing and and where where certain kinds of um, things caregiving uh, facilities whether they be for child care or elder care can be shared and housed in a common building um, another uh, principle i think is really rethinking our whole strategy around housing people who need long-term care who are very fragile, um, need a lot of support, and I'm going to talk about one particular example of that when I, when I get to the models. Um, then obviously technology friendly, I think Lisa's going to talk to us a lot about that, so I won't go into it in any detail, but just to say that any either renovated building or new construction I think has to be wired and allow for a lot of um, 
uh, access to the internet and all the ways that that can facilitate seniors <coughs> being connected to the world. Um, and finally, community engagement. I think that we may kind of question, well, can the actual design of a building or a park or a space really facilitate this? I would say it can in the various ways that I've outlined. Um, I want I'm gonna move on and we can always distribute these slides um, in terms of the specifics. So um, I wanna get into what I think are some of the most innovative um, models that, that I've seen, um, both from other countries, other cities, and I don't know whether you all know that actually in Cambridge, the mayor last year uh, created something called the Silver Ribbon Commission, which I was on. Um, we're about to come out with our final report, which I think will have some interesting recommendations, and it's all about um, housing and community building for seniors in Cambridge. So right here in, in, your, in your own backyard, which is, you know, is one of my favorite phrases, um, there, there's a lot to learn. So um, the first model I wanted to talk about it are the apartments for life. Um, uh, these tend to be vertical norks of the kind that Daniel was describing. Uh, they started in the Netherlands, and perhaps our um, visitor from the EU can, can tell us a little more about this, but I think they've been a very <coughs> interesting model, um, and they've been employed in different different countries, um, not just in the Netherlands. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of, of these apartments for life, I think, is the village square, the final bullet point, <coughs> where on the ground floor of these buildings, they build um, these areas that have restaurants and internet and supermarkets and art studios and multi-faith prayer centers and fitness centers, and they're all kind of in this big area on the ground floor of these buildings. And this is just an example of an apartment for life that's in Australia. Um, I, I've tried to put up some websites for these different examples, so if anybody's interested in getting more detail, they can do that. Um, but this is um, one in New South Wales in, in uh, in Australia that, that combines a number of the different principles that I talked about before because it really not only mixes people from different income levels and age groups, but it's very environmentally sustainable design in, in its construction. Um, another uh, innovative housing model is sort of the combination of taking green design and affordability and putting them together. And the MetLife uh, Foundation, you all know about MetLife Insurance, the MetLife Foundation has actually created an award for senior housing that take these two elements and combine them. And these are just um, two examples, one in our own backyard from Brighton, Massachusetts, and one out on the West Coast in California. They're, they're quite interesting. And this is the Casa Grande Senior Apartments in California where you can see the solar panels and, and some of the green design um, aspects. And these are all subsidized units, so they're very affordable. Um, a, a third model is the co-housing model, and this is one that a number of you may be familiar with, um, started in Denmark. Um, and their motto was building a better society one neighborhood at a time. So I think that we've had a lot of thinking that's been going on actually for several decades that can inform how we look at options for the aging population. Um, what's interesting is that there's been more and more attention these days to senior co-housing. Um, co-housing has usually been mixed ages. Um, and I just wrote down for you there in the third bullet point of resource if any of you are interested in pursuing the topic of senior co-housing. It's a really, really interesting handbook. Um, and I wanted to just give you an example. Um, it's called Silver Sage. Um, of a senior co-housing community. Um, whoops. Uh, this is in Boulder, Colorado. And I think um, not only have they done some green design elements, but they've really done a terrific job of mixing public and private space, which is very um, typical of co-housing developments. Um, this is also a senior co-housing uh, uh, example. This one has a very particular artistic focus. This this is where I'm moving in my start aging community. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing. I've heard quite a bit about it, but it, it attracts a lot of, not only people who have been artists during their lifetimes, but people who have wanted to be artists during their lives but haven't been and feel that being older and being creative is an incredibly important part 
um, of life for them in their older years. And so they, it really uh, has elder residents, but there are a lot of intergenerational arts programs, so they, they are working on the mix of ages while they're being creative. Um, this is what I was referring to before when I talked about new models for long-term care. The, this is called the Greenhouse Project. Um, it was started not that long ago, like 10 years ago in Mississippi, and there are now um, over 135 of these greenhouse homes um, in 21 states. Um, what they do is rather than what has often been called warehousing very frail elders in very large institutional um, nursing homes, they've created either on the floor or in a single house um, these living facilities for 10 seniors. They each have their own bedroom and bathroom and then all of the other spaces are common. So they're very small scale and they integrate all of the kinds of personal care and clinical services that a high quality nursing home would have in this very small scale. And this is, this is really like a movement. I mean, if you've talked to any people who um, have been in these, and there's one, again, right in, in our own backyard in Chelsea. Um, I've actually visited this. My uncle, my 90-year-old uncle, was actually um, in this facility. And I was very, very struck with the way that people were moving up from their bedrooms, were not stuck in their bedrooms, were using the communal and common spaces. So uh, um, a fourth or, I don't know if I'm a fourth or fifth, maybe I, I think this is the fifth one, um, the villages, which is not the villages that Daniel was talking about. These are villages, um, uh, this is a, again sort of another movement that was started in Boston um, a little over 10 years ago um, that promotes uh, aging in place. It's a membership fee structure model which has been quite controversial in the, um, among people who are thinking about aging in place and aging in community because it means that not everybody can, can afford to participate. And they do a lot of customized resource and referral to connect seniors with the resources they need, but there's no subsidy for paying for these. So you know, if I need a plumber, I have to pay for the plumber. If I want to retrofit my apartment, I've got, I have to pay for it. Um, but this is a growing movement. They've created a national network. There's a website there if you're interested. There are about 90 villages now across the country and 120 more in development. And this is just a photograph from Beacon Hill Village in Boston, the founding village. Um, and you can again see a mix of ages and people doing grocery shopping, um, getting some assistance with that, but doing a lot of, them, a lot of it themselves independently in their neighborhood grocery stores. And um, the final model I wanted to talk about was um, home sharing. Um, this is something that started about 30 years ago. Um, it's both in the United States and exists in a number of other countries. And it's really a service where that pairs seniors or adults with disabilities um, with younger people who really can't afford to pay for rent in the city that they live in. And so they get free rent. And in return for that, they help the elder with certain kinds of tasks around their house. And it's becoming, I would say, increasingly um, popular. Um, this is a, a photograph from Home Share Vermont, which is one of the home sharing organizations that exist. And there's actually a group in Somerville now called Staying Put that's uh, exploring starting a home sharing program right here in Somerville. So just to close, um, I wanted to you know, just pose some questions about what all this means for for urban planners and architects and landscape architects. I don't know who is who in the audience, but I assume we've probably got a mixture of some of, of these professions that people are, are moving into. Um, I want to sort of encourage you to think about, if you're going to get involved in senior housing, um, to really think about placing that housing in a larger vision. Housing for what? What are you really trying to achieve? Um, and I talk through the discussion on healthy aging with what some of the larger objectives could be. Um, I think the principles, the design principles of healthy aging that I spelled out really need to be, it's, it's not a blueprint, it's not something that you would just impose, it's something that really needs to be adapted to local conditions. And I think very importantly, it's something that needs to be discussed with the residents in the community that you might go into. <coughs> the principles make sense to them which ones are important to them, which ones are priorities. So the voices of residents and the participation of elders is very important in making these 
principles like living, breathing principles. Um, I think it's really um, important to think about doing pilot projects to potentially go into areas, in urban areas where there's already a lot of density and try creating some of these aging and community models um, that we only really learn by doing. This is still, we're still in the frontier stage, we're still in a very early stage, and I think um, we need a lot of practice in community building because in the United States we're not really taught to do that, we're really taught to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps as individuals rather than looking at our neighbors and our friends and our families and people that we don't know to get involved with and be in a social network with. Um, I think it's also really important to think about collaboration between um, architects and planners and the staff of various public agencies. I, I learned this a lot through being on the Silver Ribbon Commission in Cambridge and the sort of frustration that, that existed, I think, on both sides of the equation where a lot of times people who work for municipal governments feel like, well, we're doing this or we're trying to do this. And then the planners and the architects feel like, well, we're doing this. And, th and they're not talking to each other. So certain kinds of, I think, new collaborations are called for if we're really going to have aging and community. And finally, I just want to encourage all of you to think about this in very interdisciplinary terms. So you're being trained in a particular discipline, I was trained in a particular discipline, but really, I think aging and community is fundamentally an extremely rich interdisciplinary exercise. And so, you know, getting planners to talk to geriatricians, getting architects to talk to anthropologists, that's one of my favorite things. Um, I think it's really important for realizing the fullness and the potential for aging the community. Thank you.
my point of view, which uh, it's new since, let's say, 1950, if we call it Leslie, is in a way that, that this is a group defined by a complete lack of precedent uh, and protocols concerning how one should live, where one should live, and with whom one should live um, in the context of, uh, in a way, this kind of condition producing a group that by definition becomes a kind of demographic site of experimentation, and experimentation into both uh, new forms of subjectivity, emerging forms of social collectivity, as well as uh, what, of course, I'm interested in mostly is new forms of architectural and urban environments. And in a way, we can talk about, you know, at the level of subjectivity, uh, this notion of a kind of petri dish um, for new forms of subjectivity, the young old, articulated in terms of a kind of body which is increasingly technologized um, in a constant state of adjustment and tuning, um, just as one example of this kind of subjectivity. Also, simil similarly, we can talk about this idea of the young old articulating new forms of social collectivity outside of the models that uh, are formally dominant, such as the nuclear family or the model of the workplace as a social construct. Um, this is just an image uh, from the village's opening of the senior games, um, where the senior, um, the village's cheerleaders are, are presenting uh, their work here. As well, we can understand this uh, site really as a kind of experimental site, uh, extending new forms of social, spatial environments for the aged, um, which propose a series of models, and these are just some examples beyond, let's say, the three dominant um, models in <coughs> historically and also contemporarily. So for example, multi-generational households, institutionalized care, or aging in place. Um, my interest, in a way, is in studying these various uh, new forms of experiments, um, and there are basically four sites, um, which I'll introduce very quickly, um, as well as three historical sites that are based on a kind of immediate post-war period in the US um, that form kind of precedent case studies. <coughs> so the first one that's already been mentioned is the villages of Florida um, as the largest single site retirement community in the world, um, which was envisioned by its founders without irony as a Disney World for active retirees. Um, it applies, of course, in this way, the protocols of the entertainment industrial complex to the established American post-war model of the retirement community. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. The second site that I was interested in is Costa del Sol in the south of Spain, renowned as the retirement home of Europe, um, which basically produces a kind of linear city uh, that's dominated by communities um, that are each formed largely from their nationality. And you can see here just some examples of nationalities represented in which British and German are kind of dominant uh, nationalities. The third site is a Dutch-styled uh, theme park located in the south of Japan called House Tenbosch, uh, which incorporates a residential community inhabited largely by Japanese retirees. And the last case study, uh, which is the senior recreational vehicle community in the US, uh, which numbers, uh, by some estimations, uh, between two and three million uh, Americans who have uh, relinquished their, their sedentary home for a kind of year-round nomadic lifestyle. Um, which produces in turn a, a, a nomadic network urbanism produced by two forms of infrastructure. Of course, the physical infrastructure of the road network uh, together with both formal and informal uh, camping sites, um, but also a kind of immaterial um, digital infrastructure, which is the satellite internet uh, dishes that are used on the top of the vehicles, which allow for the kind of social staging of this community uh, online. Um, and I think we can say that collectively these experiments, um, based on this kind of view on a differentiated understanding of the old, um, of course a kind of crudely differentiated one between two formats, and of course there are many discussions around a more um, finer grain of various stages. But we can say that, that they challenge in a way the dominant or traditional formats within which we have discussed and understood the challenge of housing the elderly. And what I would argue is that this, this understanding of what you see on the right here um, is not surpassing or supplanting the existing model, but in a way we can start to understand this as an additional way of thinking what is existing in terms of what has been developing uh, recently uh, in terms of a dominant um, model of urbanism that focuses specifically on this third age group, um, which we can distinguish, of course, from the discussion of the aging in place um, strategies. So in a way, we, we can say that uh, one of the most significant transitions in this most recent 
uh, material, most recent examples, is a shift in scale um, from one which is focused around the scale of architecture um, or the building of the institution to the notion where this is increasingly in the last 50 years or so become an issue of urbanism. It's become a scale, um, a new scale. Um, and it's also, of course, as you can see in, in this kind of thing, it, it's also shifted in terms of its motivation, its ethos, uh, and its format. Rather than the term shifted, I should probably be saying diversified. Um, so I think when we reflect on these tendencies, um, I, I believe that, that a key starting point is the term ambivalence. Um, between what we can say is a form of escapism on the one hand, um, we can also talk about a kind of relinquishing of responsibilities, um, and on the other hand, a kind of project of emancipation. Um, so at one level, we can of course understand this kind of young old urbanism in a way at the intersection of kind of demographic transitions, as well as uh, the intersection of kind of ne neoliberal spatial practices that articulate both this escapism and relinquishing responsibility that in, in, in a certain context define an end game or limit condition of the continued unevenness, fragmentation, and sorting of society. A dystopian segmentation in which age is added to the conventional segmentation processes of income and race, um, as well as uh, dystopian securitization, privatization, and <coughs> denial in the sense that many of these young old uh, environments are founded along, uh, on the logic of denying the final stages of life. And of course, we can see many um, examples of supports for this kind of approach of understanding um, the, kind of, the kind of, let's say, escapism and problematization of this kind of approach. Uh, one of the most classic examples from the 1950s, um, from Lewis Mumford, who here describes the notion of specialization, mechanization, and industrialization, and the word segregation of the order of, the order of present day a meaningless, effortless, parasitic push button existence for the old, is what he describes already in 1953. And these are, of course, positions that I'm very much sympathetic to, but I think it's also important, in a way, to acknowledge this kind of emancipatory project within these examples. Um, even though, of course, we can also be partially skeptical of the, the kind of utopian drives in some formats that these various uh, urbanisms operate by. So whether this is a kind of climatic utopia, um, this is a diagram from Juan Paulo Casado, who <coughs> describes the geometry of paradise, he calls it, um, that follows these kind of uh, ideal subtropical zones around the planet. Um, we can also talk about the, the notion of the utopia of the vacation that never ends. Um, in the case of Sun City, the utopia of youthfulness, but one predicated on the elimination of youth at the villages. <coughs> to a utopia called the Long Costa del Sol, to the utopia of exotic European high culture and refinement experienced by Japanese retirees at House Table. These are the, the kind of brochures selling this letter. To the kind of dual utopias associated with the sublime of nature and the freedom of the road articulated by the senior recreational people community. And I think what, you know, while we can say that many of these utopias appear to be very banal, um, in various ways. Some, I, I would say, are particularly interesting in the way that they resonate with the recent history of utopian discourses. If we talk about 1960s and 1970s in, in a kind of architectural and urban discussion, the way that um, there's a kind of potential definition of various emancipatory <coughs> liberations, for example, in the context of Akagram's work um, that we see here from um, David Green's Log Flag project in which there's a kind of liberation from the permanence, the aesthetic, and the hierarchical of the city, as we know it, through, of course, in this case, kind of re reconfiguration of the infrastructure. And of course, this is the, the log plug that would be out in the landscape that would allow one to plug into a kind of anywhere and everywhere. Um, it already in 1969 with a kind of cable line which delivers an international information hookup. Um, so in a way, we, we can see in these kind of examples various um, moments which resonate with these kind of utopian moments uh, from the past, which also redefine, in various cases, the potential for social collective action. I think that was also a very interesting aspect of Anne's presentation around discussing new forms of collective life and collectivity. And I think another aspect of this utopian discussion is actually where these utopias actually flip upon themselves. Um, the example that I'm showing you here is from the villages, which of course is defined as a utopia of vacation that never ends. 
um, which in combination with the scale at which the age segregation is taking place in the villages with almost 90,000 people, combined with the kind of spatial isolation of this development, basically produces a new work market for second careers for village residents. So in this case, what I'm showing is a, an electronic organ shop which uh, at the time was run by a retired police detective and a retired school teacher, who through this kind of context of the villages as a kind of very uh, open work market, found a new kind of career, a kind of second career, which in their terms they define more as a kind of social rather than revenue generating exercise. Um, the idea of, of finding new uh, work markets within this context. So I think also aligned to this thread of emancipation in utopia, um, which is of course not without problematic aspects, um, one of my interests in this kind of young old discussion is to look at them as a site of experimentation and as a site of latent urban novelty, particularly as a result of this notion that this is a group of precedents <coughs> um, in many respects. So many of these novelties can be linked back to the theme of what one could see in these examples of a kind of increasingly instrumental or instrumentalized urbanism. Um, so for example, at the villages, you can see uh, various forms of these kind of novelties. One example is a kind of mutation of the conventional American strip mall typology uh, according to the programmatic requirements of the community, which in this case, the strip operates not as a retail boulevard as theorized, for example, by interest of Brown and Sino, but instead as a hospital ensemble composed of dispersed clinics uh, addressing various ailments and body parts. So once he's here, the kind of hospital strip diffusing the conventional image of the hospital as a single institutional mega building through a kind of distributed urban structure um, that incorporates the experience of medical treatment into the leisure practice of strip mall shopping. Um, so here we see uh, a diagram which tries to map uh, and zoom in various kind of clinics um, that address various body parts and procedures. So for example, one can drive along and shop for competitive chiropractic treatments uh, and so on. Um, another novel, a novel aspect of the villages is the, the kind of system of infrastructure designed for the parks, which incorporates uh, pathways, tunnels, bridges, and parking spaces, uniting the entire ground plane into a kind of smooth form of, of accessible territory. Um, and of course, in the context of Florida, um, a golf cart does not require a legal, legally a license to operate, and therefore um, it's difficult to uh, not have access to driving a golf cart if you're in trouble for certain reasons, or if one uh, has difficulties with various uh, faculties. So, uh, just as, as an example here, uh, what you see is the red lines, so or the pink lines, are documenting this secondary infrastructural system. Um, we see this kind of zoom in. Um, not only as we understand it in a conventional context, the idea that it is a system within the landscape of the golfing uh, area, but also here where we see it um, in the residential areas and within a kind of more complex system where we see a developed uh, kind of transportation grammar of uh, bridges, tunnels, uh, off ramps, uh, roundabouts, parking systems, and so on. And I think what, what also these instrumentalized urbans, urbanism start to demonstrate in a way is a kind of alignment of the social and spatial. Um, one example of this is in the combination of the villages. We see where, for example, the golf cart infrastructure, um, which supports in many ways a uh, culture of drinking and driving home along the pathways in the villages, together with the theme structure of these town squares, uh, which concentrates this one single demographic group around kind of entertainment activities, which is this kind of extended happy hour and free music downtown, which in combination with, uh, of course, various pharmaceutical products and also the, the product on the bottom right, which is called Big Ox, um, which is actually a, a bottled oxygen product that you can buy over the counter at gas stations at villages, um, which I was, when I was asking, I, I was wondering if this was some kind of supplemental um, oxygen product for, for people who are on medical oxygen. But actually, it's reportedly used for uh, fast uh, curing hangovers. <laughs> <laughs> so this suggests that this infrastructure system is not only technical, but it is radically social um, in its performance. And in many ways, we understand how this also, of course, um, represents in many ways very much imperfect experiments. Um, imperfect experiments in, in the sense that um, these experiments are nonetheless, I would argue, necessary in a 
attempting to produce alternate formats that challenge these historical uh, expectations for what living as an older person would be or could be. And in return to this, this kind of uh, topic that we were discussing, um, what I would argue is that this would be a project um, in many ways of kind of selective learning from, um, one that in no way advocates these kinds of organisms in these formats, um, but one that in many ways applies relevant material techniques and conceptual approaches that could be explored and understood from these contexts that they could be applied to, to other contexts. And I think what well, potential um, host contexts for these latent novelties, whether we talk about a kind of secondary or intermediate speed of transport system, or whether we talk about alternate understandings of the model of the hospital, whether we talk about um, extreme levels of amenity density that was discussed previously. Um, of course, in a way, these could be aspects that could be imported broadly into the discipline of design. I think at the same time, we can also talk about how these can be imported into aging in place practices. Um, but of course, I, I would uh, add the qualification in this context of aging in which place. Um, and the image that I'm showing here, of course, is Alex McLean's image of suburban Las Vegas. Um, and I think also, as I said, that there are obviously very much serious challenges of addressing the questions of aging in place in the context of lower density areas, um, in the context of spaces in which in the post-war period we find ourselves amongst the kind of extreme dominance of dispersed or urban formats that are based of course on the logic of the single family house, on the logic of course of in an aging situation arriving in oversized homes with burdens and maintenance, in many cases where families have moved away. Um, the problem, of course, of density is not only in terms of a mobility challenge when one loses one's ability to drive, and not only a question of issues of social isolation uh, as a result of that, um, but also, of course, simply the challenge of, of having uh, support mechanisms and things to do within these kinds of low-density environments. And I think these are just questions that are kind of foregrounded I think by looking at these other examples. So just to make it clear that it's not an advocation of these formats, but in many ways to understand them and to find how one can uh, learn from them. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Um, just quickly build on what we've already talked about and not repeat anything. Um, but I want to mention, so I work um, at a place called the Atlanta Regional Commission. So that is what's called the Metropolitan Planning Organization, uh, which some of you are probably familiar with. And we're also the Area Agency on Aging. We actually handle all the water quality for the Metropolitan Atlanta region and workforce development and land use planning. So it's kind of a wide, some days schizophrenic, but other times comprehensive uh, portfolio of issues for the metropolitan area. But as the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the Area Agency on Aging, we are responsible for transportation planning and for planning for the older adult population. Uh, we serve the city of Atlanta and the 10 counties that surround it, uh, which include 78 different cities. So I want to just tell you, focus a little bit on the public policy implications of some of the things that Anne and Dean have already raised and how we're attempting to grapple with those um, some days successfully and some days not so successfully on the ground. Um, and I don't want to reiterate anything that folks have said, but you know, fundamentally this is about birthdays, right? And the fact that we keep having them. And, um, and that is, um, by almost everybody, considered a really great thing. And aging or not, I mean, I learned very early on in my work um, that as soon as you start to define aging, you'll, you just need to start with the fact that nobody who you're talking to fits the definition and you'll always be right. And that would be if you're talking to 85 year olds, 92 year olds, 67 year olds, or 45 year olds, they are in fact not aging, it's somebody else aging. So we stay away from who is actually doing this because it seems that nobody is, um, but we do know that everyone is continuing to have a lot of birthdays. And the numbers that have already been presented to you 
um, are really phenomenal numbers. And it's not just that we have the growth of the older adult population and all of the things that Anne and Dina already said and Daniel also said, but the, the key thing is that this has never, ever happened before. So with human beings living on the earth, it has never, population distribution has never looked like what it's about to look like and what it already looks like in places like Japan. So we really are, as Dean said, in a very a tremendous stage of experimentation and trying to rethink something that we have never done before. Um, and I think that both gives us the opportunity to make really big mistakes, which um, I think we are, and the opportunity to be extremely creative knowing that we're in a period of tremendous invention. Um, and it's really, some of our questions from a public policy standpoint are all about how do we spend public infrastructure? How do we, how do we spend public dollars, in particular around infrastructure investments? And the fundamental question that we have is why, when the greatest gift of the 20th century arguably was the gift of longevity, right? We just didn't used to live very long. We didn't have to talk about aging. And when Social Security was invented, longevity, life expectancy was only about two years after the age of retirement. So uh, that would be like getting a new uh, plan for retirement that says you'll get your benefits starting at 85. You know, that would not feel the same thing to us that it does right now to get benefits at 65. So the 20th century, through tremendous medical and public health advancements, gave us the gift of living a lot longer. And yet during that same period of time, we spent massive, we built massive public infrastructure pretending that that wasn't happening. So we spent billions and billions of dollars on all kinds of investments pretending that we don't actually grow old. A very strange thing to have medicine and public health advancing our longevity, and yet the dollars we were spending on roads, and on housing, and on building communities, the vast majority of communities built in the United States after uh, World War II, we pretend we built them acting as if we don't grow old. And why did we do this, and why do we keep doing it, is sort of our question at the Regional Commission. So what did this get us, a 20th century where we have great longevity, and yet we spent our money pretending that we don't grow old? Well, despite the advances in um, cosmetic surgery and wonderful products, and it sounds like these people in the village is having a great time um, doing God knows what. So we also have, right, you know, these things we've already talked about, housing that's only built for people who don't grow old, um, a transportation infrastructure that totally ignores physical changes that occur in everyone. There is nothing you can do about it. Your vision peaks in your early 20s. Your hearing peaks in your late 20s. If you're over 28, you're on the downward spiral. It's already happening to all of us, right? So our physical bodies change, and we have built a transportation infrastructure in this country that is assumes that you can see really well and hear really well. And all of you who will get in your car tonight are hoping that everyone else can see and hear really well. And simple biology will tell you that they're probably worse off than they were last year. So we have this very rigid transportation infrastructure relying on something that doesn't occur, which is perfect vision, perfect hearing, and great reaction time. It's also gotten us, you know, this, this ignoring um, of what goes on with longevity has gotten us health statistics that we can't really be proud of. So national health statistics for older adults, that this, this idea of we get to grow older, but most of us don't do it very healthy. And I just thought I would show you Georgia's numbers because we in Georgia compete with Louisiana and Mississippi to be the worst in the nation, and we don't have anything to be proud of. So these are our, our rankings on the key CDC health indicators for older adult population. Um, so we haven't got, uh, we haven't got necessarily been doing all of this, and it's amounted in great health either. And then uh, something we're already talking about in this country. Um, in, with a lot of vigor is healthcare, but certainly this has also amounted to tremendous amount of dollars going into chronic care. Uh, so beginning, we, we get to age, we get to live longer, but most of us are going to do it with chronic diseases. This is actually very expensive and not necessarily what people desire either. So I'm blowing over huge topics very quickly because, um, and so we can talk about any of these things that you want to. Um, but for us in Atlanta, we called this realization that we get to live longer and we haven't been spending our money as if we do, our 80s hair moment. Because you just have to stop and think, what were they thinking? You know, why, why would they have done such a thing? Um, and, and we had our own 80s hair moment and where our job is to help all the communities in our metro region have our, their own 80s hair moment and move on is the most important thing. So what is it that people want? Well, they don't usually talk about it as well-being, but it is generally what people describe when they talk about 
what are they looking for in their lives. And the values, the things that they're looking for um, are often the same. It's about security, it's about ease, it's about convenience, it's about being able to be the person you wanted to be to maximize your individual potential. And perhaps, in fact, uh, well-being should be the goal, not necessarily living, that we expand longevity in infinitely, but maybe that we get to have all of those years and have those be high quality years. So we embarked on the process and we're actually, um, it really got underway in about 06, so we won't go through all of what happened, but um, it did culminate in a very, very large effort uh, that was in educating our communities throughout the metropolitan area on, on this whole phenomenon, on the fact that they were growing older. And it took us about two years to get to every city council and county commission and hold a whole series of community meetings, but we did, and it culminated in 09 in a, a massive design charrette. And it was uh, 10 days um, and 1,500 people participated. We studied six different communities. And while there were 20 architects and planners there, they were matched with over 25 geriatricians, social workers, hospital administrators, and doctors. And those folks did, were not allowed to leave during the 10 days until they figured out what interventions you could make in those six sites in a, in a very typical suburban sprawl landscape that is the Atlanta region and is most of America, um, what kind of interventions could you make to make it possible for people to live there throughout their lifetime? And when we've worked on this uh, effort, we call it lifelong communities, it's called many different things, Anne told you uh, many different models and examples, but they all kind of boil down to the same thing. Our lessons at the end of that um, were pretty basic. And the one that's not up here that we don't usually put in print is that in the Atlanta region and in most places in the United States, a lifelong community would in fact be illegal. And uh, it's not possible to build these places. It is in fact against the law. And it would be more accurate for people to hang a sign and say, um, it, is, it, is Ill it won't be possible to live here after you're 62, 68, 73. And why is that? Because our um, land use policies, our transportation policies, do not make it possible to have the kind of communities that Dean described and Anne described that are flexible, that in fact incorporate the changing nature of our body and our desires and our minds. So we can, we can talk about that if you want. Um, we had some core principles. These are very similar to some of the things that Anne raised, so we don't need to go into them in great detail. But what is it that really matters um, in these communities? Uh, that what is it that people need in order to live together, to be able to support one another, for people to access the service they need? And we had a set of seven principles that emerged from there, um, and all of which were incorporated into the final designs of our six sites. And now, ever since 09, as we have continued to work with communities, we work to emphasize these principles in their public policies. Um, the great thing about these principles, as was um, there was a market research team that's been working with us, um, is that they really not only work for this growing older adult population, but they work for the population that we are desperate to have in the Atlanta region and every metropolitan in the region uh, in the United States has to have. If you lose, um, you quit being cool, um, you will lose economic growth. So there is, we um, exist because we continue to grow. And there is no static position when it comes to economic growth. You are either growing or you are on the decline. And you have to continue to um, attract young people, um, energetic, innovative people to the community and the same quality of life that market research was showing that they are looking for mirrored um, a number of the key characteristics that were essential for a community that could support people throughout their age. So I want to talk about the process of policy change for you. Um, and how we began to go after that and how we are continuing to go after that. So it's a picture of sausage making. And I know you've heard that before, but I will tell you that is what I do every day. Um, and it's, it's really what it is. Um, and so what we went after was kind of a three-pronged process. That one of the most important things we needed to do was quantify the need for this. That while everyone would um, accept the truth that we are growing older, um, just quantifying the need and making that a local uh, number so that people could understand that the numbers of the change in their community, how people were changing, was an important first step into having an active dialogue and conversation about community change. So uh, we find that large global statistics or national statistics on the change in the older adult population doesn't matter one bit to a city council um, or a county commission that they need to understand their own numbers. Um, 
The other effort that we've uh, pursued is just educating the marketplace. So uh, developers tend to be the most risk averse uh, people out there. Um, they like to do what worked four or five years ago and bankers are even worse. Um, and so that's why often we get the communities that we have uh, is that they worked before. The great thing about um, some of our work culminating in 09 is that nothing has been happening uh, when it comes to development and uh, certainly in our area, we have been hit extremely hard by the housing crisis. And so it's our opportunity to take a big uh, deep breath and that has allowed for a lot of education in both um, the banking and the development community, which has been wonderful. But then the other critical part is this this issue of what's legal and not legal. And so we began to understand that we have significant policies in place that create the communities that we have. Those communities don't work for older adults, and so some of those policies have got to change. And I just wanna touch base, touch on some sort of some, what are those, some of those big policies? Um, one is the way we finance our transportation system. Um, it is, it, it incentivizes uh, one way of doing things, particularly in a place like Atlanta, Georgia. Now, where we are right now is a number of more options, but you have still some fundamental challenges with transportation finance here in Massachusetts. That we have to relook at the way that we finance our transportation infrastructure to build in more flexible options and alternatives. And I'll, I'll end um, telling you a little tale of how we began to do that. You're gonna hear more and more about this. If you haven't already, uh, they did reauthorize the transportation bill at the federal level, but they just did it for two years, which was just a way to get around, get over the presidential election. So come 14, 2014, they're gonna have to redo it. And then you're gonna see really significant conversation about uh, raising the gas tax at the national level, um, how we begin to find alternative sources of finance. The fundamental issue with transportation finances is, is that we fund our transportation infrastructure through a gas tax. Most of that tax is by gallon. That works really well when you can buy, you, you have to buy a lot of gas to go a little distance. But since the early 80s when our cars have gotten much more fuel efficient, um, that math just doesn't add up anymore. And we're continuing to have gas just maintaining the infrastructure we have. So they're gonna be new financing mechanisms. That's a huge opportunity to, to move away from the emphasis on roads uh, that require so much physical capacity to manage a single occupancy vehicle to alternatives that support um, different ways of getting around. Another issue, and I think that we've already talked about this, is just infrastructure design. So how those things are designed, whether it's the universal design of a home to the universal design of a larger community. What uh, seems very clear to us is that it doesn't matter if you have the best uh, door knobs, door levers, and the light switches are all in the right place. If as soon as you walk out the front door, that community is completely inaccessible to you, um, then uh, you don't have what you need to be able to live there. So we're uh, community-wide accessibility and alternatives to actually changing the Americans with Disability Act and the way that local communities implement that. Um, preventive health, preventive health policies have become a big emphasis of our work. How to make preventive health easy to access so you know, the cheapest way to age is um, by being healthy and uh, the most enjoyable way, certainly. And so what people can do, just simple basic steps to combine preventive health measures. So, I mean, it, it is so simple, it's hard to even mention, but it really actually is hard to, it is challenging to do on the local level that public health um, in most communities focuses a lot on children. Um, but but there are tremendous things to do just to make it easy for older people to get a number of tests and screening all in one place. So when in the Atlanta region, um, in many of our communities now, when you go to get your flu shot, you get signed up for your next mammogram or your colonoscopy um, or your pneumonia vaccine and getting it all done in one place would dramatically increase just the simple acts of preventive health that people need. And then again, things, I don't wanna go into these because I think we've talked about them and we will talk about them probably in your Q and A, but design for healthy living. So, so much about our communities actually make it very hard to be healthy throughout the lifetime and simple um, design changes about how we live and how we live together, making it easy to exercise and get out and be engaged in the community. Um, those designs have to be facilitated by plans and most importantly by zoning. Uh, and so this is just one community that this is how uh, this is its sort of town center and after working with um, our team and many of the partners that we work with, they redesigned and adopted a whole new master plan to increase their density, to put in a whole series of neighborhood-based retail centers and uh, to start a shuttle uh, service, a small circulator in between the neighborhood centers so that, that actually
actually by going from one to the other, you can get most of your basic needs taken care of. This is a small town in a highly suburban area south of our airport. It only has about 12,000 people now, so um, it came down there. So zoning, 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 we've worked more on zoning than we ever imagined that we would. Um, that's where a lot of the legal issues come in, making it difficult for people to have accessory dwelling units, to um, integrate as um, some of the, like the greenhouse model that Ann mentioned, um, is a wonderful model that will also often require a zoning change so that you can integrate more supportive living right into a neighborhood. Um, that's those changes, without those changes, it's illegal to do that. And so um, the zoning really is where a lot of this comes down. So I want to just tell you a little tale about policy change um, because the reality of policy change is sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And having um, robust community dialogue um, has can be a, a dangerous profession sometimes. Um, and so we just uh, finished a massive transportation referendum in the metro Atlanta region. So I'm showing you the city of Atlanta and the 10 counties that we serve. Um, it was an effort that was started in 06 uh, to get a law passed to allow communities to come together and increase their sales tax by a penny over 10 years to support transportation infrastructure. The Atlanta region is actually half the state of Georgia. Um, and it was a very prescribed process, but the bottom line is it included about um, three and a half billion dollars for transit, three and a half billion dollars for roads, and included the single largest investment in transportation services for older adults and disabled people ever in our history. So it was a very diverse set of projects, um, and it went down in flames. Uh, it was the largest voter turnout we've ever had for a summer primary in the history of Georgia. All of those people turned out to vote now, it turns out. So 62% no, 38% yes, a um, huge amount. Normally 15, 12% voter turnout in a, in a primary election like this, you can see 30% voter turnout. There were three regions in the state of Georgia that did pass it, but it was overwhelmingly no. And so now we're in the process of dissecting, you know, so here was a potential policy change, uh, $10 billion <coughs> campaign to educate uh, folks about what that would be, so it didn't lack resources. The opposition only ever raised $14,000, um, and uh, th so it wasn't that, um, and certainly it was in an economy, and there's all kinds of lessons learned, but uh, we also know that older adults overwhelmingly voted no uh, for this. In fact, they were the largest portion of voters, and they voted it down. So one of the realities of policy change is not just knowing what you need to do, um, but making it happen on the ground uh, in a very real way, whether it requires the level of community consensus that you have to see at a ballot box or, or what now feels a lot simpler at the city council level or county commission level. Um, so if you want to talk more a little bit about that, I'd be happy to. Um, so part of the lessons uh, from all of this is that uh, policy change is a risky business and we're often calling on local elected officials if you want to make the changes that are needed to support a community that makes sense for uh, people who have changing bodies and changing minds, which is all of us, um, then we have to create an environment where it's comfortable for some of those key leaders to take risks and, um, and even lose if it takes that. Because local zoning, uh, local transportation funding can be extremely controversial and more people have lost office on these things. One of the ways we do that is we let people define it for themselves. So whatever it takes to be a community that accommodates older people with actual infrastructure, um, that suits their needs, uh, we let them define it for themselves and come to it in their own way. So um, if they want to start working on transportation, they want to start working on housing, they want to start simply by having a walking club to get older adults out and walking, uh, we let communities lead first and then bring them to these dangerous issues of what's legal and what's not. So that's all out there. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha. 
most of us in this country want to age in place. We want to live in our homes. We want to live where we are now. So when AARP does a survey of 50 people who are 50 and older, they're not necessarily interested in moving from the suburbs to the city. They're not necessarily interested in moving to, um, you know, bucolic world, you know, miles and miles away. They want to stay where they are. Um, if that's like your lives, you've, you've built your social connections, you've built your networks, um, you have memories in the home that you're in, and a lot of people want to stay put. Um, it's familiar, it's comfortable, it's what they know, it's what they love. Um, but we also know, as, as has been described tonight, that as we age, our bodies change, whether we like it or not. And uh, most of us don't like the changes that happen with age, even if we're exercising and staying healthy um, to the best that we can, we may have to manage, you know, our, our genetics may catch up with us, we may have to take you know, high blood pressure medication or cholesterol medication, and our bodies are changing you know, regardless. So one of the first questions we had was, um, there are two questions actually. One is, are people's home environments places where they can age successfully in place? And then are people ready for some of the designs that would enable them to age in place successfully? So our research has really focused more on the, the home and a, a much smaller sense of infrastructure that has been talked about tonight, but I will, uh, you've, you've heard about that, but this, uh, I'll, I'll just focus on what we've done. So home is a place where when you go there, they have to take you in. Um, but we also think about it often as that physical structure um, and then the physical environment. And I want to suggest that what we should be thinking about the home as is as a kind of system. The home is really a platform and an opportunity to enable successful aging in place. So we think about the home as that physical environment, that option, but then also how can we integrate services and technology into that platform to enable quality, you know, quality of life as we age, to, to make sure that people are aging with well-being, as Catherine described it. So I'm going to talk tonight briefly about housing options, technology, and services. Part of it is the social participation is really built on some of those pillars. It's the technology and the services that can enable that social participation. So housing options, first up. So the ideal for designing for older adults, um, as, as we did some our research, was thinking about what are principles of universal design. So what are simple things that we would expect to be in homes that would be really friendly for aging in place? So things like zero egress, and zero step means of egress. Wide enough doorways to accommodate wheelchairs, walkers, you know, those, those things that kids go in that spin around. So things that would really work for people at any stage of life. Um, first one, master bathrooms, uh, bedrooms and bath. Um, you know, showers that you can walk into, no thresholds between rooms. Um, and ideally you want locations that do have, as, as you've heard tonight, access to services, access to community and we thought, where should we look for this? Well, why don't we look at some of the 55 plus communities that are claiming that they are designed for people who are active older adults. So we started to look in the Metro Boston area and we said, okay, let's, let's find out where these places are. This is a map of the, the facilities in the, in the Metro Boston region. And we wanted to look at whether these communities incorporate these different features that we would look for and we would expect to see in terms of, of housing. So we went out to about 20 of them with a little checklist and went through. And found that there's a remarkable consistency across communities in terms of what they offered. And let me tell you, first of all, if you cannot climb stairs, there is one unit that we were in that you could live in as long as you didn't mind living in the basement. Um, but every place else, if you came through the garage, there were steps to get up. There were steps to the front entrance. So if you couldn't climb stairs, these weren't really places that you could age in place. We also talked to sales agents at these places because they were typically the ones showing us the units. And several of them were eager to tell us about how they had worked with um, design consultants to make sure that these were places that were very age friendly. And so they had done things like put the paddle door handles in place. Um, and in some places there were things that, you know, they clearly had paid a little bit more attention to lack of thre you know, thresholds between rooms. But you didn't see that these were places where simply anybody could walk into and regardless of what happened to you, whether it was something temporary, like you broke a hip, or something more permanent, like you became disabled and needed to live in a wheelchair, that these were places that would be very difficult to leave. Um, there were, however, some things that we did see that, that were more positive. So universally, there were the first floor master bedrooms and bathrooms. 
um, low thresholds and you know, they have a ubiquitous platform to handle. Um, but little, little else, so again, stairs everywhere, bathroom and kitchen designs didn't anticipate that you could even retrofit some of these places. So for example, in some bathrooms, there, were, there wouldn't be room if you were to wheelchair or to walk or to transfer from that to the toilet or walls that were blocked to enable grab bars. And then we also looked at you know, what kinds of services do these places offer, and very few offer any kinds of consistent services to really enable um, aging in place for people who might need more assistance. Um, so why was there this disconnect between what the communities were ostensibly designed for and what they actually look like? Um, so part of it is that grab bars and things that look like old people might live here are places where most of us don't really want to live. So um, we we don't really think that we're the kind of people who might need assistance when we're older. We all think we're going to be that 75 year old who's playing tennis and rushing around and doing all these great things or you know, decides to take up ultra marathoning um, at the age of 78. You know, we envision ourselves as growing older and being those active, healthy older adults. When the reality is that as we grow older, um, not all of us are going to be that way. Um, so in these communities, it was really in part about marketing. Who are you marketing to? What is it that people want? We also did some interviewer interviews as part of this project with some contractors, and contractors build what people bring to them. Um, basically, what we heard was this kind of needs to be market driven. So it's this push pull. Contractors aren't necessarily going to go out and invest in different kinds of designs and different kinds of building unless people are coming to them with the information that they want this. But people don't necessarily know that they want this, and they're concerned that. If them things like universal design and grab bars that 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 indicates that that's the kind of person that they are not. Um, the other thing I just would suggest is that if you look at that map for where these developments are, first of all, a lot of the communities didn't provide services internally, but many of them were also in locations where services were not readily available, and that's partly a function of where the land is cheap. You can build these new developments in places where land is less expensive, and that's typically farther away from urban centers. Um, as one of the people we did an interview with said, um, these places essentially have a hidden program. The message of these places is, if you can't get around to here, you don't really belong here. Um, we also, as part of a, a different arm of this study, um, conducted some focus groups with participants. And as part of it, we showed them these photos on the right side of the screen, which had universally designed elements in kitchens, bathrooms, and home exteriors. Um, and it, you know, we chose pictures deliberately that had very high-end finishes, things look very nice, nothing looks institutional. Um, you know, the bathroom picture on the right side looks like a spa bathroom you would see in a very fancy hotel. <coughs> so in half the groups, we had people fill out a brief questionnaire about what they thought about the picture. So they had a couple minutes to look at it. We had them fill out the questionnaire and then we did a discussion about the picture from what they saw, what they liked, what they didn't like. In the other half of the groups, we had the discussion first, and then we had them fill out the questionnaire. And what we found was that people who had the discussion first and filled out the questionnaire, in the discussion, a lot of times, somebody would realize, you know, I see in this bathroom that there's space under the sink. And you know, I, I need that for storage, but this would be really good for someone who's in a wheelchair. Or we talked about the kitchen pictures. Well, everybody likes the roll-out shelving, but why is there a lower counter? I, I, I don't like that. You know, that's fine if you know if you needed to sit, but I don't have that problem. Or well, why would you have your dishwasher up like that? You know, that just looks funny to me. I, I, I don't like it. Um, so as soon as you had somebody mention wheelchair, handicap, those were things that I think in the course of the discussion led people to frankly be less favorable. So um, people who in the who had this questionnaire after the discussion said that disagreed that it was easy to visualize the kind of people who live in homes who look like this. Um, they didn't think that the kitchen looked like it'd be welcoming to others. The kitchens like those weren't really meant for people like them. Um, these kinds of kitchens don't look familiar to me. Uh, bathrooms like these are not really meant for people like me. These types of bathrooms aren't familiar to me, and these kinds of bathrooms would be uncomfortable for me to use. They were more likely to agree with those statements compared to the people who filled out that questionnaire yet I would offer to you that these are expensive rooms and if you live in a remodel your house it would cost you plenty of money and I suspect they would find you to be delighted to live in those rooms. Um, so housing options are one like services are another piece of it. So how can services help? They can help people stay comfortably in their homes longer and as Anne has 
talked about already, um, you know, we have the village model, and, and Dean mentioned as well. We've got Beacon Hill Village, we've got um, organizations like SAIL and Madison Wisconsin. So what are people looking for in their providers, in, in services? They want verified, trusted providers, they would like integration of those kinds of services, but there are barriers to using them. Obviously, cost is a huge one. Um, stigma is another thing. Do you want to be branded as the person who needs help? Um, and culture, is it okay for who you are, where you are, go outside the family, for example, to get help, um, to ask for services. One of my colleagues, Philip Olso, did a survey in um, Germany and Switzerland and Austria, and he was looking at uh, what the interest, the older adults' interest in, in different kinds of services was versus their option use. And although in Europe, most of these services are subsidized, what he found is that in most cases, with the exception of public transportation, gardening, um, the interest in using those services far outstrip their actual use. So what's the difference? You know, why is there this barrier still to using services? Um, and so again, you know, do people view them as something that they can or should use? Do you have trusted providers? Um, and then I would suggest also that not only is cost a barrier for people using the services, but the village models that we've talked about, Beacon Hill Village manages to survive financially because they are not financially viable on their own without those grants. They can't make enough through membership to support themselves. So the model is still not worked out. It's not something that, in spite of the fact that it's, it is expanding, as Anna said, it's not something that has been able to be replicated or successfully other places. I talked to the people who run the sale um, village or began the sale village in Madison, and they're really struggling with whether they'll be able to keep it because they simply Services are another leg. Thinking about what are the ways that we can try to integrate services? How do we overcome the barriers to how people think about it? The cost barrier, that making sure that we have trusted providers that people feel comfortable <coughs> using those services. Um, we don't have a good solution to that, but clearly integrating those services, bringing things into the home, not necessarily suggesting that everybody leaves the home to reach all those amenities, but how do we bring those services in so people can age in this country? Right? We need to think about other ways that we can and finally, housing and technology. So we've held out technology for many, many, many years as the solution to helping people age in place. Um, and most people, when we surveyed them, um, AARP found that folks would be willing to use some kind of technology to support their ability to stay in their own home. So some kind of activity monitor that would make sure that you got up in the morning or that you, know, you, you were walking around during the day. Um, but again, what we see is that older adults actual use of these kinds of services and these technological services is far below what they say they would do. Um, so even the things like the life alert um, badges, you know, that in principle, that sounds like a great idea. You've got a little button, you fall down, you've got a problem, a health issue, you call somebody. But the percentages of people who use it are quite low. Even in the UK, where it's subsidized, you still only have usage rates around 15, 16 percent. So why is it that we see that the reality of these uses Fail to match the promise and what we all held up before. So there are a couple barriers that we know um, exist to technology and age in place. So one is again the perceived benefits of the technology. Do you see the benefit? Is it going to you see or understand how that technology is going to help you? Um, is it clear that there's a use benefit for you? Um, what are the costs of learning to use it? And that is balanced off against the usefulness. If it doesn't seem like it's going to benefit you that much, why invest in learning how to use? Um, there's also a privacy and independence <coughs> versus security trade-off. Not all older adults want to be monitored every day and have that information sent to their adult children. Um, so, you know, we, we don't want to treat older adults like they're infants. <laughs> and older adults for yourself don't want to be treated like infants themselves. So how do you balance that need for privacy, the need for independence against the need for security? And that where that balancing point is for people is going to likely change over time. Perhaps as you become more frail, you're more willing to trade off some of that um, privacy and independence for some more security to still be able to live independently. Um, but how do we how do we make it so that people can have that kind of trade off and that people can think and, and make decisions that they're comfortable with um, about what you know, the degree to which they want the technology in their home and perhaps beyond. And then again, identifying what the job of the technology is. 
what is a bit of going to do? Is it going to do something like the project that we had last year, which was the e-home system, which integrated medication compliance with social communication? So it was a system that tracked medication, um, <coughs> medication, but it also served as a communications tool with adult children. So it had a Skype fun Skype-like function in addition to um, you know making sure that you took medicine, medication on time and sent reminder notes to older adults they didn't take the medication would also send if you chose to could send reminders to your adult children that um, you either had missed the medication or that everything was okay. <coughs> so there's a the te technology holds out a lot of promise for us and things like wireless make it much more possible that we can retrofit homes without having to think about you know ripping walls out and things like that but we still need to think about um, what is it what is it that the technology is going to do in the home how can we um, integrate the technology so that it doesn't scream stigma that an old person lives here um, you know you don't want to have you know the, the pills on the counter and you don't want to have the technology that says here's somebody who's frail and needs assistance so how do you integrate it in the home so that from a design perspective you don't you walk in and um, it's a home that's comfortable to everybody and it's a home that the person who lives there feels comfortable having you know, somebody new walk into. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell somebody something about themselves that they're not interested in sharing. Um, and then how do we make sure that the technology is doing the job that we want it to do? Um, so again, to, just to, to recap briefly, um, we really try, we've really been thinking about the home as a platform to enable successful aging in place um, for whatever environment you choose. But we want to integrate not just the physical structure, but also the how can we try to services, um, technology to enable greater social participation and higher quality of life. Um, and our ongoing research um, is around still trying to understand older adults' needs and willingness and barriers to adoption of these different kinds of components uh, to technology and thinking about how we can aid successful aging in place. Thank you. And we have one, one more short presentation. Um, and. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have some time for discussion. Um, so I'm actually uh, teaching a, a studio here on this topic, uh, and I was blessed with 12 brilliant students, uh, and they're amazing. And so we spent the first two weeks of class kind of looking at the best practices for age-friendly design. Um, and I think the students did a really good job of this assignment, so we had the th I had the thought, um, why not uh, invite them to sort of make a class authored presentation that kind of gives a synopsis of some of the things that are out there, some of which we touched on today, some of which we didn't. Uh, thought it would be a great um, stimulus for discussion, not that we need any more. Obviously, there's so many things on the, on the table here, but uh, so um, you guys want to come up? So one more, uh, ten, 10 minutes for a presentation, and then we'll, we'll have time for discussion. Um, so maybe just if you want to sit around there and pull up some more chairs. So good evening, my name is James. I'm a second year MUP student, um, and I'm from New York. And my name's Siobhan, and I'm a third year MLA student, and I'm from San Diego. And my name is Teresa, and I'm a freshman third year student, MLA four. So So um, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at various housing alternatives for seniors and how these options differ in terms of accessibility, medical care, proximity to friends and families, and crucially, cost. Uh, we started to break down the notion of the elderly as a homogenous block, and we've seen that what works for some seniors may not necessarily work well for others. So in light of these complexities, how should we think about best practices in design, and how might they adapt to different circumstances? These questions are pressing. Uh, over 70 million Americans of the baby boom generation are reaching old age in the next 20 years. 
And senior-specific housing is expected to become uh, the fastest growing sector of the American constructor, construction industry. What is it that's currently being produced and how will future designs differ from what we already know? Uh, innovations that address aging are taking place across diverse scales from the smallest implanted devices to the reorganization of entire towns. Um, so our presentation is a selection of best practices from across these different scales, demonstrated through uh, the daily routines of two hypothetical seniors, Mary and Pat. Um, but please note that in our effort to illustrate a wide range of practices, we understand that some are cost prohibitive, and we hope to convey that this is a challenge in itself. Um, but where possible, we've also included affordable options. So um, meet Mary, she's an early riser. She wakes up in her apartment um, in an arts-themed independent housing complex for seniors, and she anticipates the activity-filled day that she has planned for herself. So a bit about her, she's a retired art teacher, and with her modest pension, she was looking for an affordable option. She discovered this community catered towards seniors with a modest income, and she could afford the maximum rent of $1,700 a month, but knows that if her pension dries up, she can offer subsidized rent as low as $400 a month. And Mary is grateful that she made it off a wait list of 5,000 applicants. Um, she's, ha she's hard of hearing, but she's otherwise relatively mobile and healthy. Um, but still, should her health deteriorate, she would have to move into a facility that offers skilled nursing because this one doesn't. So as she does first thing every morning, she reaches for the external device for bone anchoring hearing aid, or Baja from her bedside table and places it over her ears. With this device, external sounds from Mary's environment are transferred to her cochlea by burn, uh, bone conduction, allowing her to communicate and actively engage with her family and friends on a daily basis. It also enhances her environmental awareness of potential dangers like passing cars, and this in turn improves her ability to na navigate streets safely and independently. Unfortunately, while some states cover the $30,000 cost of the procedure, her insurance wouldn't cover the entire price tag, so she's still trying to pay off the cost. So after getting out of bed, she walks to her kitchen where she fills up the 360 kettle. By the gentle push of a hand, the kettle rotates, pouring hot water into a cup without any need to pick up the appliance. Um, and over the stove water faucet, uh, also allows Mary to avoid carrying a heavy kettle from sink to stove. For the next half hour, she happily sips her daily cup of matcha green tea and eats toast while holding up her iPad with her pain-free wrists. <clears throat> Fueled for the day, uh, Mary goes to her living room where she set up her private painting studio. There she paints portraits of her family and friends and favorite medium of acrylics the skill she developed in the studio courses offered through the housing community. Um, living in a skilled-oriented community helps Mary stay mentally engaged, fosters a sense of pride and accomplishment, and promotes social interaction with her peers. Um, Mary takes a break from painting, her latest masterpiece, to escape Skype with her brother, who lives in a gay and lesbian-themed retirement community in Palm Springs. This task is made all the more easy by an interface her son installed for her with extra large buttons, and that connects directly to a few essential applications and websites. The $8 a month cost of the telephone de device is worth, staying, uh, is worth staying connected with friends and relatives. Mary's brother tells her how relieved he is to have found an accepting with retirement community. During this conversation, um, he recalls some of the other specialized senior housing, or she recalls some of the other specialized senior housing options she discovered in her search for retirement home, including one designed specifically for seniors with Japanese heritage. And although she appreciates the wide uh, range of housing communities available, Mary is reassured that she made the right decision in choosing her arts-themed housing community. So Mary realizes that it's time to head over to the local senior center. So we are with her friend Pat. So after chatting with her studio, she makes her apartment through the courtyard, which was designed as a contiguous public space, giving everyone unobstructed access to areas. Excuse me. The design also avoids an institutional aesthetic. So while waiting for whoa, sorry, while waiting for her driver. 
provided by a local concierge program for seniors. She looks over her shoulder to the senior outdoor gym across the street and recognizes some of her friends staying healthy from the exercise equipment designed specifically for seniors. So Mary meets her friend Pat at the downtown senior center. Together they take a social networking class with five other seniors so they can keep in touch with their grandchildren who live out of state. The center offers many classes as well as affordable meals, legal services, basic health care, and organized excursions. All of these are essential to their independent livelihood. Um, so Mary, Pat, and her classmates meet together in the senior center activity room. Uh, Mary chooses a vegetarian chili, but Pat decides to have chicken. So Mary and Pat then leave the senior center and go for a stroll down Main Street. Both the Kmart and the local craft store sell hidden meal items, but the local craft store has an age-friendly certification sticker in the shop window, so they decide to look there. Inside, Pat sits down on a comfortable bench while Mary browses, and it doesn't take her long to find the collars she wants because the store is well lit and prices are clearly labeled. They both feel that these basic amenities help them maintain a sense of self-reliance and dignity while shopping. Mary heads back to her, continuing her retirement community to take her daily nap. Uh, Pat still feels energetic, but decides to go home to take care of some chores. Uh, her home is a 20 minute drive from Main Street, but she has several transportation options. She decides to call the township ride program because it's an on-call service, as opposed to the shuttle bus, which is on a fixed schedule. She figures it's worth the five bucks, or four. Um, Pat arrives at her son's home, where she lives. She really likes living in her granny flat in the backyard because she gets to have her own space, but she can still see her grandchildren every day and babysit while their parents are working. The granny flat, flat costs $1,700 month, which was more affordable than either retrofitting her home or going to an assisted living facility. Although Pat is still independent, she has been showing early signs of memory loss. So the one place she feels most comfortable is her garden. Throughout the yard, pathways are clear, even be paved, and well lit. Her family retrofitted their backyard pathways in a loop configuration. This circulation pattern will prevent Pat from feeling lost or confused when her dementia becomes more advanced. Um, Pat waters her plants, and she's very glad that she decided to buy these raised flower beds because she no longer has to bend over to garden as she did before. Pat gets ready to go to the warm house, which is a community event party. The surprise makes drive away, so she decides to call the senior concierge service because the township ride would take too long to come and pick her up. The volunteer driver arrives home and she brings her to the warm house. And the town's white volunteer driver is vouchers to com compensate them for gas. She likes this option because she can pass with the friendly drivers that come. This song the warm house is hosted by Ito. They are joined by many other friends who live alone and appreciate the warm house because it gives them the opportunity to host guests in their otherwise lonely and quiet house. <laughs> a typical gathering is mostly the original, the children, the grandchildren, neighbors, and friends of all ages. The warm house offers a lot of good conversation and Pat often gets helpful tips from her friends about senior benefits in the neighborhood. They also get the home cooked meal for $25. The big news this week is that we all got a job as a greeter at a movie theater and on watching the group Project Independence. This is an organization that helps pay seniors a job. She's working three half days, earning a small income, but what's most important for her is that she's maintaining a, self, a sense of self 
you like. Now it's time for Park to go home and get ready for bed. When she gets home, she's, she's reminded to take her medication because she uses a health management system to keep track of her medication taking schedule. If she forgets, she, her son, and her doctor will be alerted and usually her son will remind her. This is particularly important for Pat because her memory is still in work as it used to. Sensors and telehealth systems also detect if and in case she gets out of bed. <coughs> Just before going to bed, she decides to take a bath. You can easily do that because, uh, because the graph or the non-stick chlorine in her bathroom and shower will allow her. All of the vertical surfaces of her home have been equipped with weight steering fixtures that keep uh, that uh, that helps her maintain her balance at all times. Thanks to the grab bar by her bed, she's able to get into bed comfortably. It's time for Pat to clap the lights up, and it's time for us to call it a day. <laughs> Mary and Pat's daily routine illustrate a range of best practices that help seniors maintain their health, independence, mobility, and dignity as they age. Thank you for listening. <coughs>
this kind of like challenge in society, but actually also understanding uh, the potential for uh, exploring new uh, formats for design formats for understanding how to see people that actually, in a way that was touched upon, could, could open up uh, new sets of policies and atmospheres, uh, new aesthetic, new kind of social conditions that could be extraordinarily uh, exciting and potential. So that's, I guess, I don't know if that, that Very much your question. Very much, yeah. Maybe we should uh, open things up to the audience uh, if anyone has any questions. Is that, is that a constant uh, factor in the research you're doing? And I mean, is, it seems like there's so many um, studies 
steps that have to be taken before you can maybe implement a lot of what you're talking about. A lot of the, even even before you ask a lot of the questions you're talking about, which are incredibly important questions. There's first the, the will anyone listen to us ask them, um, and not just the fingers. Is, you know, is that um, is that a major problem? And, and if so, is there? I don't know what I'm asking. Is there anything? Well, yeah, I'll start. That? I'll start with an answer. I think, and then maybe um, we'll have some time in. So, I mean, the big. I mean, I'll just try to be very frank, um, which will mean that I'll probably say something that's a little bit wrong. But <laughs> the um, the thing about if you want to, you know, drive forward the aging banner, you're going to find that there's nobody following you pretty quickly. Um, and I mean, only people participating in sort of a theoretical exercise. Um, and so there's there is a challenge that you're attempting to work on behalf of or be a part of a group that nobody else is really willing to join. But I mean, there's something something so basic about, I mean, we get out of bed because we're fundamentally optimistic, right? And so um, if we weren't, you know, I mean, some of it's denial, but some of it's optimism, and that's not necessarily uh, a bad thing either. Um, I think that this is another grand area of experimentation in, in the time of invention. How do you even begin to talk about these things? What are literally the words um, and what are the, um, the ways to think about it? I mean, um, one of the things we have uh, worked with, and you'll hear me talk about transportation so much because it's such a challenge for us in the metro region, um, is that you, you know, people need to not demand that they have to have services because they're now frail. You need to demand that public transportation is for the whole public, not just people who work from nine to five Monday through Friday, because that's what most transportation networks are built for, is take really one trip out of you know all of the trips you take. It's really designed to help you take that one trip to work. Um, and so sort of models language and um, policy strategies that are around empowerment. But I, I showed you our, our map of the recent referendum um, because we, we don't, I don't know. I mean, we really, that was just like a total failure. Um, and older adults absolutely said that they um, were not interested in new taxes, and particularly for projects that weren't going to come online for you know six, eight, ten years, because a lot of infrastructure takes that long, even though you know this huge investment was going to start delivering services about three months into the taxing period, for you know, just those shuttle rides and the things that you described with Marion Cat. So I, I think we're really in, in discourse about this. I was just with AARP Financial Policy Council yesterday, and they said the same thing. We are trying to talk, find a way to talk about this. It has to be about empowerment. It has to be about um, we have an ideal of independence, even if that's what we think it is, and sort of beginning to recognize that as interdependence in another way. So I think the jury's out on this, um, but it's, it's a very exciting I just want to say that I, I think that the whole issue of trying to take a lifespan approach and the issue of intergenerational programming is really, really critical because I think if I, I agree with Catherine that if you just kind of are marching with the banner of aging, you're going to find out there's nobody you know marching with you. Whereas what what I've really found in trying to sort of break down some of the elements of what an aging friendly community would be is it's really a community that would serve all ages very well. And a lot of the principles that I talk about are really things that we all need. Um, and I think that I really like the concept of apartments for life that can sort of accommodate people at different life stages and can, you know, that you might move into different kinds of apartments within a particular building as you go from having little kids to having teenagers to, you know, being, without having your children or grandchildren around and your body changing and declining. Um, so that, so it, you know, I, I've done a lot of my work over the years on issues of work and family and how people can integrate those. And I really, every time I think about these aging friendly environments, I, I say to myself, this, this is what like working parents, it's what little kids need. Um, and you can really imagine these sort of exchanges where, you know, a working mom who can't leave her job at two o'clock in the afternoon because, you know, our, there's this total disconnect between work hours and school hours and it doesn't work at all. Um, but, you know, if you had an intergenerational building 
then maybe the elders that were well enough and wanted to could help care for kids after school, and maybe the you know the parents could do something, pick up as they go go grocery shopping after work frantically to get dinner on the table. They could also pick up some things at the store for the elderly person who's watching their child. I mean, you can just imagine all kinds of interaction among the generations. So I really think that this idea of age mix is really central um, to our re to the grand experiment that, that Catherine's been talking about. Um, I, I would say that, yeah, I think that um, a lot of it is about framing how we think about these issues, how we talk about them. Um, our conception of older adults now has moved from, you know, you're all frail to 60 to new 30 and seven, you know, so we're starting to, I think, develop some of those images of older adults as active, you know, involved people. Um, but we don't see ourselves as being anything about that. So I do think that that's part of the, um, it's not really in our sets. And having a point about, well, we're optimistic. Well, we're not all planning for the day when we're gonna you know, be in that walker, and then you know, finally get that wheelchair. Um, it's just not the, it, it's not how we envision our trajectory. sell a universal design on things other than it's good for aging. Well, it's good for young people, it's good for um, grandchildren, I think AARP has coined the term visitability. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you might be in a walker, that you might break your hip, but it's your sister who's coming to visit, or if when your mom comes to visit that you're gonna need those features of your home. Um, so I think you know, reframing that is important. But I also think it's important to note that, um, as Dean said, yeah, we are, this is unprecedented historically. Um, that we have this aging population and it's great, it's an opportunity, things are going to be different. But it's also put a tremendous, it's, it's a problem societally that we, it's a challenge societally that we really haven't faced before. Um, but we can't necessarily expect that, you know, density is great, we all want density. Every transportation planner you talk to wants density. Um, you know what, people don't really love using transit. People don't really aspire to turn 65 and start using So how do you then create, you know, that's something else though that we need to rethink about how are we going to get people to think about other ways to get around. Density is great, but we can't have density everywhere. So all of a sudden the, you know, we've been heading out toward the suburbs and, you know, we're living farther and farther away from city centers. Is that kind of really reversing itself now? Um, so I think that there are still things that we're doing now that don't suggest that we're suddenly going to you know, have these urban centers materialize out of nowhere and that we're all going to want to move to them um, when we get older. So there's, there's, there's a lot of, lot to figure out still. Any questions? Mm -hmm. oh, cool. uh, I think that uh, when you are talking about society, you think that it's for everyone. Because uh, in your project, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that the majority of population that I follow has that vision of what is possible. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is so it's about the integrity of the project. What we want to design. We don't want to design a bus for hundreds of people. It's not the dream of us, it's a solution. <laughs> Homogeneous communities, 
right? That people don't actually um, self-select increased diversity as they grow older. They, in fact, usually throughout their life, I mean, tend to hang out with people who think the same things and look the same. I mean, I don't know about the RV community, and I don't know uh, the demographics of the villages, but I would put money on them being largely uh, the same. Ninety-eight um, percent white. Yes. So, um, and that's really interesting, especially when you think about RV communities, people are driving all over, but just to meet the same kinds of people yeah. in different <laughs> places. So, I mean, I think that's something really interesting, the ideal versus the real behavior, and how, in fact, as we grow older, we just, um, I mean, I would bet that a lot of us do that, right? We hang out with people who think the same things politically, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's a tendency we have that gets magnified, I think, with age, too. And so it just throws some of this because we are talking we want to age in, in place, but we want to age with the neighbors, with the community, not not cold landscapes and places and trees and everything. But we want to have our nice neighbor living with us. If not with families and at least with people we know and we trust and so on. But when somebody is moving out of the way, one has to move with him to the the microphone, please, Sorry. for us that are, you know. And by the way, 60 is not exactly 30. <laughs> Close. But. So I was just saying that, that, just I wanted to add one comment about this discussion of aging in place, that one thing that I would kind of be hesitant about or want to kind of raise is this issue of the, the kind of romanticization of Place, uh, homeless place through this kind of discourse of aging in place. And I, I've read somewhere some figures about the average period between which Americans move homes. And it's something extraordinary that every four to five years on average, an American moves into a new home. So uh, for me, that, that's the kind of question around, you know, what is the, what is the question of place in this notion that stay in their home, um, what this suggests in the context of such a kind of extreme mobility, um, mm -hmm. that it's also not only at the point of the individual house, but also in the context of larger family structures, right? That, that these also are rapidly moving. So I guess for me, I, I, I have kind of background concerns about this notion that aging in place is the only model that we should be trying to achieve, because I see certain questions that 
um, that, that I think should somehow be in there. Yeah. And of course, it can't be the only model. It's, it works uh, well for the, the young old and the medium old, but the old old. Will always, we will always need um, assisted living, right? We'll always need nursing homes. Um, but the question is, how will they be designed, and in what right. context will they exist? Yeah. Exactly. Can, can I just say one thing that I feel is, is a, a bit missing from the discussion, at least in terms of the United States, is the very, very significant um, class divide in the United States, um, the sometimes called the you know, growing wealth gap, and there are a lot of different terms for it, but it really, really affects the experience of being old in this country, at least, and I think that one of the arguments for aging in community is the idea that resources can be pooled, that we don't each need to have our own dishwasher, we don't each need to have our own washing machine, that there are kind of collective ways of doing things that um, could work for people as they age, and especially who have very limited resources. Um, and I think, you know, some of these phenomenon of people moving a lot and so on and so forth, I think are class-based. And there's also a racial component. And I've been doing a lot of work over the last year in four neighborhoods in um, Boston uh, that were with heavy concentrations of low-income African Americans and Latinos. And people tell me they've lived in these neighborhoods for, you know, 72 years and like 50 years and, you know, they've been there a long, long time. So, I mean, I think we need to, somebody talked before about how we can't see the elderly as, as a homogeneous block. I can't remember which one of you said it. But I think it's very important to disaggregate the aging, not only by the extent of frailty or lack of frailty, but really by these class and racial and cultural divisions. At least in the United States, I think it's very, very important um, and really is shaping some of the discourse we're having around what aging in place means, what aging in community means, what retirement means, all of these things. I'm just curious, have you found in your research that there's different, um, that there's different responses, that stigma plays a different role in, in different groups that you've looked at? Because when you're talking about, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that obviously it's important to, when you design ideas, it's important to work with, uh, with the people who you're, 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 you're designing for, which is, of course you're doing. Some of your, some of the ideas, um, mixing public, private, having these shared kitchens, uh, which I, I guess that makes sense, and I, I guess that architects have been excited about for, for a long time. Um, there's st like there's still very unpopular among certain populations. I know that we're looking, we're going to be doing some work in Long Island. This the the, the idea of introducing co-housing and shared, you know, even granny flats. It just it went down, kind of like the vote in Atlanta, uh, and in part because of some of the things that, that Lisa was talking about stigma. So I'm wondering if when you talk about the different the, how this is a race and class issue. Does that, does that affect uh, stigma in a way? Are there different uh, stigmas that different different groups have? I'm not, I'm not sure I know how to generalize about that. I, I mean, I just, I think that, um, you know, part of what I really like about Dean's work is, is really talking about the kind of cultural construction of lots of different sort of terms and ways of living in, in different countries and so on. And I, I think that, yeah, I think that stigma does vary across some of the different groups that I've worked with. And I, I'm not sure I want I would want to say, you know, well, like African Americans feel less and such or Latinos, you know, because those communities need to be disaggregated and, and made complex also, um, just as we don't want to talk about just kind of Americans. Um, so I, I'm not sure about about the, the issue of stigma, but I, I just, I think that part of what we're talking about in terms of different designs for our communities, for our seniors, and so on and so forth, has to do with huge cultural shifts in people's thinking. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, you know, something like, um, you know, the whole question of our roads and how much we are putting into our roads, I mean, 
you know, I, I actually think that we should be paying a lot more for gas, and I'm probably one of the only people that thinks that, but um, I think there should be carbon taxes, and, you know, I think we need to change drastically the whole way we think about transportation. That's a huge cultural shift, and I think a lot of what we're talking about when we're talking about aging is really a huge cultural shift. I mean, it's not only acknowledging how our bodies are changing and that we actually are getting older, but what do we need to support ourselves and our families and the people we love in a, in a situation where wealth is clustered in a very small percentage of the population and there's huge economic insecurity and economic need in large sectors of the population and people are growing older? How do we put this all together? That's a perplexing enough question to end on, I think. <laughs> you want to think about. Thank you so much. Thank you.